smog reducing granules. There's a layer on the outside that acts as a photocatalyst, means it, it means it reacts with UV light from the sun. And um, when you put it on your roof, uh, you can have the smog fighting power of two to three trees. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Josh Orman, uh, Strategy and Marketing Director for 3M Industrial Minerals. We are going to talk about shingle granules. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Hey, Josh, thanks very much for being on the show. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I... I uh, I gave your title, but can you tell me what you do with at 3M, please? Yeah, um, we have a small division that makes uh, roofing granules mostly. And so um, I get to be involved in marketing, strategy, business development, uh, new products, and uh, some of the more like pricing portfolio management of the business. So a lot of hats, uh, small division. Can you tell me like... Uh, what, <laughs> what, what, what do you do? I mean, like, are you in charge of purchasing them? Are you in charge of developing the, the products? Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I don't get a whole, uh, involved a whole lot in purchasing, but, um, from a marketing standpoint, we do some partnerships with our customers that make shingles. Um, if you've seen, uh, shingles that feature Scotchgard protector or smog reducing granules from 3M. Um, we help with the marketing for that in some instances. Um, from a strategy standpoint, you know, we're looking at building our strategic plan, kind of where we want to go, what we want to be in the future. I presume part of that is like deciding how much uh, material you're going to need in a given year or for a time period. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, capacity is important, uh, as we're seeing with current supply chain issues and, and other problems, uh, for sure. So, yeah, capacity planning is huge. Um, you know, understanding where we want to go with new products, kind of what the market wants and we'll pay for and we'll add value for them. Um, that's the sort of new product development standpoint. Um, then we get involved in uh, pricing, you know, understanding where the market's moving, where we need to be with price. Um, I get involved with, uh, we have a, an adjacent minerals portion of our business where kind of everything that comes out of our minds that cannot be used for granules we try to sell that into other avenues to keep it from, you know, a landfill or, or piling up uh, in piles at our quarry sites. Mm, that's really interesting. So how does one uh, get a job like yours at 3M? Um, I started, I've had a long journey, probably seven roles within the last 15, 16 years at 3M. I started out in finance. Uh, that's my background. Um, I had a few roles there. It's a giant company, 90,000 employees across the globe. I've worked in, um, you know, our office supplies with post-its and tapes. I've worked um, in corporate strategy. I've seen a lot of different parts. I started an audit, actually, internal audit. So going out to our plants and auditing their processes and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so you kind of, you join up and then it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure after that at 3M. Wow, that's that's really interesting. So, how many folks work in your division? You said it was small, and you also said that 3M had 90,000 employees. So, yeah. So, between our lab and sort of marketing administration, we've got 20 to 30 employees, depending on where you want to draw the the bounds. You mm -hmm. know, we have a lot of uh, corporate functions that support us as well, and then in our plants across our four plants, our quarries and our coloring uh, operations, we have. You know, roughly 400 employees. Wow. So, what exactly are the little mineral particles that are on top of shingles? Are are they are they different minerals owing to the color, or are they all the same? Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. So, uh, they are different minerals. Uh, in general, what you want for a granule is, you know, getting back to ninth grade geology here. Uh, you want it to be an igneous rock, so meaning it it formed from a lava flow not cooled too fast, so it can't be glassy. You, can't, you have to block the light, so it has to be opaque. Um, and then it's gotta be around a six, six and a half on the Mohs scale of hardness, if you remember that, Patrick. And then, um, <laughs> and then gonna, it's gotta 
It's got to yeah. take color well. It's got to hold color. So you got to be able to put uh, your pigments and your clays on it to be able to um, make it any color that you want, basically. And what are the uh, the pigments? Are, are they other minerals? What is it? Yeah, um, it's a good question. They're inorganic pigments um, that you would typically see in other ceramics or other industries. Um, you know, we do have some specialty stuff that go into more specialized products that we have. Um, but in general, they're kind of basic pigments uh, that you'd see in, like in any industry. Like iron oxide or yeah, exactly. yeah. carbon plaque, Ti that kind of thing. Titanium yeah. dioxide, I presume. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So these common pigments that you see in all kinds of industrial products and consumer yeah. products. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And where do they the minerals come from? Are they mined locally? Yeah, we have four mines kind of geographically dispersed around the country. So uh, Wisconsin, Arkansas, uh, North Carolina, and then Southern California. And so we've got mines at all of those sites where we're pulling mineral. And then we have uh, coloring processes where we're, we're making uh, the granules. Close to the mines, I presume? Very close. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've learned about like mineral products is you don't ship them very far <laughs> because they're heavy, right? Right. And I think that's really largely how roofing products developed around the world is whatever was abundant and cheap that was local. You use that to build. And so you pull this stuff out of the ground. I presume mm -hmm. it gets kind of crushed and, and, and you have to, I'm, I'm assuming, get other uh, associated rocks out of the deposit. Is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, we have geologists that, um, you know, understand our minds really well. And so when we blast, we, you know, we put, you know, blasting caps and we, we do a shot, um, you know, largely they're targeting pretty uniform spaces in the mine. So there's not a whole lot of sorting, mm -hmm. but then absolutely you're crushing to size. You're running it through screens to get it to be the particle distribution that you want for ideal coverage on a shingle. And uh, then you're coating it. And what colors, I mean, I'm guessing this probably changes uh, decade to decade, but what colors are the most popular or, or do you sell them in equal amounts? Um, that's a great question. We sell um, not in equal amounts. Uh, some of the highest runners are like blacks and grays. Um, you know, from a shingle blend standpoint, you can get uh, multiple colors on a shingle, you know, five, six, seven different granule colors that go into that blend. And you probably know some of the popular colors like uh, black or weathered wood, um, grays uh, are very popular as well. And do they cost different amounts to your shingle manufacturers, like depending on the color? Yeah, yeah, depending on the color. Well, sometimes the pigments can be very expensive for certain colors and, and um, we don't run them as often either. So you kind of get a double hit on cost. Uh, so like your greens and your blues are going to be more expensive to make, even from a raw material standpoint than other colors. But interestingly, in my observation is shingle manufacturers don't charge more for uh, green shingles, as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess they're just eating that additional cost. You know, uh, we don't tell them how to how to price <laughs> their products. So, yeah. <laughs> So once you get these things out of the ground and you've uh, dyed them, I, I, what do you call it? The dyeing? Coating. 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 Okay. Yeah. And yep. you've coated them. They're probably in some kind of uh, big bin. Do you, do you do further things to them then? Yeah. You know, um, a lot of times granule manufacturers will put oil, oil on it to de-dust. Um, you know, we use special treatments to do that as well. Um, you know, with, with oil, if you just use straight oil, one of the drawbacks is you know, if we go to the North Shore a lot and, you know, you pick up a rock from Lake Superior that looks really shiny and, and beautiful. And then when it dries, it's kind of like, oh, what what happened? That happens with oil, too. So it looks very polished. And then when it burns off, you can get um, variation in the color. And if that doesn't all happen at once, you can get kind of spotty, a spotty looking roof about a few months into that after that installation. So um, we have a a coating that we use to avoid a lot of that uh, variation. Interesting. And yeah. you mentioned the the Scotch Guard protection earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the the coating of the granules? That's a great question. Um, it's Scotch Guard and brand only. It's a protector brand. Um, what it is is the technology is a copper 
uh, coated granule. So there's a thin layer of copper underneath the pigment that leaches out tiny copper ions over time. And if you use them in enough frequency evenly across the roof, uh, it can actually keep algae from being able to form on the roof uh, for the life of the roof. And uh, that's the kind of black staining that roofs often get, right? Especially where yeah. they, when they're in shade. Yeah, like north sides of roofs a lot in the Midwest, any where it's humid. I mean, the, some contractors joke in like Louisiana and Florida, doesn't matter what color you pick because it'll be black in a few years, <laughs> right? Because it just yeah. gets covered. Yeah. Um, we've done side-by-side -side roofs in Florida where we do Scotchgard on one side and nothing on the other. And after six years, like it's literally fully black instead of the gray, the light gray that it was. And then the Scotchgard side is just looks like the day you put it on. I got to think, and, uh, uh, you know, that's always dangerous, uh, that that helps with the uh, reflective qualities that are uh, part of some shingles, right? Some shingles are better at reflecting. Uh, Solar heat. energy. Yeah. yeah. Patrick, I think, I mean... I would hesitate to make a claim without data to back that up. You know, we haven't necessarily tested that, but that makes sense to me that um, if you're able to preserve the lightness or even we have cool granules that are required in Southern California um, that reflect 20% of solar energy, if you can keep those uh, clean and intact, I have to imagine that that would help. But again, I, I'm I'm from 3M and in data we trust, so uh, we haven't <laughs> tested that. So, what are some of the advancements that you've seen or have heard about uh, in in the roof shingle granules since uh, you've been with the company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we've been making them for 90 years, so it's uh, it's been a long time for us. That sounds like probably uh, as as long as they've been along around. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're one of the oldest divisions. We have the oldest plant in the company. Um, yeah, we, 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 our heritage is important to us for sure, our history there. Um, in the 90s is when we came out with the copper granules. Uh, 3M introduced that to the market to keep algae off of roots. Um, in the early 2000s, we invented the cool granule, which is, um, you can get it still in black or brown or whatever color you want, but it can reflect 20% of the solar energy that's hitting the home. I mean, I know, I'm not, I know you're not going to tell me your company secrets, but how does that work? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, when you think about solar energy, it's like half visible and half invisible. And so if you have a white granule, you can reflect some of both of that. But if you've got... Um, you know, a special mechanism to reflect some of the invisible portion, you can still have a color that you can see. Like I can see that that's uh, weathered wood or black, but then half of that, you know, it's not fully half, but the ultraviolet and the infrared, you can reflect some of that spectrum and get, uh, you know, solar reflectance from that, from that granule. So the way the window business does that is with a thin layer of uh silver on you know mm. one or both panes of glass is it something similar that you're you're doing to reflect that energy yeah i'd say it's um you know theoretically similar well, if we put it that way just less uh fancy maybe <laughs> than, uh -huh. than putting silver into it yeah yep. How and then, many... so that was in 2000 okay and then um, in terms of innovations, uh, then just a few years ago, we launched um, smog reducing granules. So um, there's a layer on the outside that acts as a photocatalyst, means it, it means it reacts with UV light from the sun. And um, when you put it on your roof, uh, you can have the smog fighting power of two to three trees uh, on your roof. Is that getting any traction in the marketplace? You know, um, I, I'm sure lots of folks are going to say, well, I don't have smog in my neighborhood. Why do I need to do that? Right? Yeah. Um, you know, it is getting traction. We've got one of our customers that put it in all of their shingles. Um, I'd also say that, um, you know, nitrous oxides, so NO, NO and NO2, 
are dangerous at the parts per billion level. And they're largely generated by anything that's uh, high heat combustion. So like diesel engines, um, you know, factories, energy production, uh, other types of industrial production. So if you live near a busy street, you've got smog. And, you know, we don't want to paint it as like a, a silver bullet for pollution or any of that kind of problem, but it just, it does its part. It helps. Actually, recently that manufacturer I mentioned, um, they've put in enough roofs into service in the United States to be the equivalent of a million trees of smog fighting power. So maybe for the individual house, it's not as important as in aggregate, the, the difference or impact it could have. I've got to think that that's a marketing strategy on behalf of that uh, shingle manufacturer, right? That's good PR, yeah. right? Yeah, it absolutely is. It's one of their lead. It's one of the things they lead with. Yeah. So how many shingles are we talking about that are put on roofs in the U.S. annually? Do you know that? Yeah, I do. Um, so in the past, like when you think about coming out of that early aughts boom in housing before the crash, I think we put on 175 million squares. And so a square is 100 square feet. So you move the decimal point twice, and it would be 17 and a half billion square feet of uh, asphalt shingles. That's kind of been the high water mark so far for our industry. And is it are you guys still trying to catch up? I mean, I've heard of all kinds of stuff in short supply with regard to recent supply chain issues, uh, are shingle companies having the same problem? Are you having trouble getting enough minerals out of the ground? Yeah, you know, I think the industry in general has been feeling constrained. Um, you're right that so then after that crash, we had about a decade of just kind of flat, um, you know, you can't call it growth, but just flat uh -huh. uh, market. And then since probably 2016, we've experienced a very sharp um, uptick. The market's been growing at, you know, six to seven percent year over year uh, for the last five, six years. So, um, yeah, at, there are shortages everywhere with um, some of the components that go into shingles. Uh, you know, some of our components, we do our best to dual source and implement a lot of those other strategies that keep your uh, facilities running. But certainly, I think the entire industry has essentially been running flat out for over a year. And so equipment starts to break down if you can't do your um, so maintenance, yeah. if you can't, yeah, do your replacements. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can and everybody is in, in this situation right now. Hmm. So when the granules are shipped to the roof shingle manufacturers, is this like in trucks or is it rail cars? Uh, both. Yeah, both. you got it. Yeah. yeah. So we'll ship truck, We'll sh depending on how close the plant is. It's sometimes more economical to ship trailer, about 25 tons in a trailer, and then about 100 tons in a rail car that uh, we'll ship if they're farther away. And like, how long would that last? Uh, how long would a rail car full of granules last a manufacturer? Do you know that? <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, so about one ton of granules is on your roof. So 3000 square feet and the manufacturers can make substantially, you know, they, they're big, fast lines and it depends on the plant, but yeah. Um, a rail car, probably just a couple days uh, at the most. So I, I could get that number for you if you really want. It's it, just but. like, you know, it's hard to put any of this in context of like how many shingles we're talking about. I bet seeing you've probably seen the manufacturing lines, right? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what impressed you about that? What was surprising to you? Just the scale. I mean, anytime you go into those plants, they have just the jumbos of the fiberglass mat that act as the scrim for the shingle and just all the tons of silo space for, you know, the granules to be dropped and, the asphalt mixing. It's just, it's a very fast, large operation. We'll be back with more right after this. Regular listeners to the Fine Home Building podcast have heard us mention Zip System Building Enclosures 
the integrated sheathing and sealing solution system, providing a streamlined approach to exterior water, air, and thermal management. But they may not be aware of the multiple resources available to builders with application or installation questions. Huberwood.com has the install detail library and access to the technical information team. How-to information is also available on the Zip System YouTube channel and on Instagram and TikTok by following at Huberwood. So, uh, anecdotally, I've noticed that light-colored shingles, especially white ones or nearly mm -hmm. white, uh, seem to last longer. Uh, my parents have Owens Corning Shasta white shingles that were put on in the mid-80s. Oh, wow. And they, and they still seem to be okay. The wow. roof has everything going for it. It's steep and uh, unshaded. So, okay. you know. But is that true? Uh, is there a good reason to believe that the lighter colors last longer? You know, the I, I would think so. I Again, I don't have data to back that up, but um, the purpose of gran granules, essentially, it, it, I mean, you got to look good, you make the roof look good. That's one of their main roles. But then the, the other main role is to protect it, uh, the asphalt, which is your weather, you know, that's your water barrier. You have to protect the asphalt from especially UV light. And so if you've got a good shingle that the asphalt is good that can hold the granules in for a long time. And you're reflecting a lot of that UV energy. I have to believe that um, that could extend the life of your uh, shingle product. So uh, do you test the, the granules to see how they perform? I mean, uh, yeah. do you get your clients shingles too and, and put them out and yeah. Absolutely, Patrick. Yeah, we do both. So um, we have a weathering station uh, in Texas that we put up test shingles and test roofs. It's, you know, it might, it might be even close to a hundred six by six panels. It's a pretty cool place. Um, it, you kind of wouldn't guess it's there and then you stumble on it and it's like, Oh, well, this is really neat. Um, and can I and guess then, you picked yeah. Texas cause they have, uh, tons of sunshine and, and yeah. harsh weather, right? Exactly. Pale. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Trying to get the full gamut of, uh, an aggressive weathering environment. Yep, that's right. And then, yeah, we have our release tests um, where we're looking at um, making sure we're hitting the color we need to hit consistently, making sure that um, some of the other elements that are important for shingle manufacturing are met with the granules. Like, like I said, particle distribution for good coverage and, um, you know, looking at contamination, uh, looking at other uh, aspects of it chemist chemically to make sure that, um, you know, it looks good going out and into the shingle. Do you uh, have other um, ways to like lab test them before you get that far? I mean, it would seem like risky mm -hmm. to come up with a color, make a whole batch of this stuff and then have it not work. Yeah, oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, if, if we're coming up with a new color or anything like that, there are a lot of lab tests. Then there are even real world trials before we even ship a product um, to a customer. And a lot of times you can salvage that product by using it in the headlap region of the shingle that's not exposed and you don't see it. Um, so there are ways to you know, not waste that material. But. I see on shingles, it, it seems like manufacturers, you know, have used what they have lying around for that part of the shingle you can't see. Yeah. Is, I'm guessing that's what's going on, right? It's probably the least yeah. expensive uh, of the granules. Yeah, you can use um, yeah the headlap region. You can use raw rock. You can use locally sourced um, materials like that are left over from other mining operations. Um, you can use if there's any spill in your process for how you're putting your granules on your shingle. You can use that spill back into the headlap. Um, if we have, you know, sometimes we have a color that didn't hit spec, so we'll try to you know sell it as a uh, you know, a headlap uh, so that we don't have to waste it. And so uh, when you guys are talking to your clients, is there a purchaser at Owens Corning or GAF or whatever on the other end? And he's saying, I need two rail cars or 10 rail cars or whatever. Is that how that's working? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we sell to, I can name them, and I'm sure it's Please. on our website. So yeah. uh, Owens Corning, Certainteed, Atlas Roofing, and Malarkey Roofing. 
those are our four accounts and um you know it's even plant to plant level so there are essentially supply chain planners and purchasers at the plant level that will order to our plant and they coordinate shipping they coordinate um deliveries all of that it's very much um an in sync operation we have to be very close to our customers to make sure that um you know there's not a lot of storage as you can imagine for thousands and thousands of tons of granules so right it's a lot you know one week and if we don't supply in a week you know it could there could out. potentially stock somewhere yeah out. their yeah. line is shut down right yeah, yeah. And that's uh, you're not making any money when that equipment's sitting around. I'm sure nobody's that is making any money. Nobody's painful happy, right? situation for the folks running the plant. Absolutely, and our contractors aren't making any money, and it's just all all through the channel. We got to keep it running. So I've observed uh, during big hurricanes that the price of shingles uh, goes up, and mm. I'm assuming that's because the demand is uh, also gone up, right? Can you respond quickly to like natural 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 emergencies like that? Yeah, you know, uh, how would I phrase this? There is some surge capacity in the industry. Um, a lot of that has, as we mentioned, been eaten up in the last, you know, 12, 18 months. And so, um, you know, previously, absolutely. Like, uh, I think 2018, if I'm not mistaken, was a big storm year where uh, there was hail and a couple hurricanes that hit back to back. So we were able to surge and, and provide an extra, we estimate it to be around 2 billion square feet of shingles into those storm, into that storm activity in that year. Um, so yeah, there is, or had been surge Some capacity. capacity. Yeah. There's still maybe some in certain geographies, you know, largely it's a geography game too, right? So if, um, demand is really high in the Pacific, you're not going to ship from the Northeast shingles or granules even all the way to the Pacific coast to be able to surge. And so you just kind of have to work with what you've got even regionally. This is my favorite part of the show. So can you tell me about your own house? Are, are you a homeowner? Um, I am a homeowner. Um, I live in the house that I grew up in. So oh, that's cool. Yeah, my parents bought this house in the early 80s. And uh, my partner and I, uh, we bought it from them maybe four years ago. And, you know, while she was helping with the kids, I spent a lot of time uh, fixing it up. So I have a lot of pride of ownership now in the house uh, that I grew up in. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, do you like working on the house or is it just a necessity? I, I really like DIY. Um, I really like plumbing and electrical and, uh, you know, some of those other spots where it's now really hard to find people to do yeah. that. And especially at a price point that, um, I always say I, I would never hire anyone I could afford. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. But I, it, for me, it's just curiosity and learning too, you know, and, and so some of the stuff I hire out cause it's just either too much work or. I'm not confident enough in my abilities. Like we put in drain tiling. It's a 1920s house. So, oh, cool. uh, you know, older, uh, I had someone put in drain tiling and egress windows and a sump pump and a radon mitigation in the basement as an example. Um, but I converted our whole main level from baseboard radiator heat into in-floor heat. So, uh, like a staple up, uh, PEX aluminum PEX system. I bet an, your neck uh, hurt for days after that. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> I got a weird thing too, where I was kind of, I was getting a little dizzy and I, you know, had to go and it was something to do with my equilibrium was off. So Looking yeah. Looking like that all the time. It yeah. was a lot of this and I tried to do it ergonomically correctly, but it's hard. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine there's anything ergonomic about that. So, uh, have you, have you replaced your roof on your house? I have not, um, not yet, thankfully. <laughs> Do you know what kind of shingles are up there? Are they one of your clients' shingles? Uh, no comment. Okay. So, <laughs> my, 
my my parents made the choice before I knew any better, so I wasn't able to advise them during that purchase. We should tell folks you live in St. Paul. Can I guess your folks moved someplace warmer? Um, they didn't. They moved uh, kind of northeast to Wisconsin on a lake. So um, they retired up there. And then they do the snowbird thing where they're going to visit friends and relatives in Arizona and Texas and Florida over the harsh winter months. So, Do you ever think about doing that? <laughs> Every every mid February, when you've had two weeks of no sun and uh, you're like negative twenty, why do I live here? And then spring comes and you're like, oh, this is incredible. I love this. So, you know, uh, companies have handled the pandemic d- in different ways. Did you? I see your work. It looks like you're working from yeah, home. Work from um, home. Yeah. Is that a new normal for you, Josh? It is. Yeah. Um, you know. Whenever it was early March, I'm even forgetting when, but um, 3M, March of 2020, I'm guessing, yeah, right? 2020, yeah, 2020, yeah. 3M made a decision to have everybody who could work from home. Um, you know, obviously, we really appreciate the folks in the factory and the labs where you can't bring that equipment to your house right. and run it. You can't bring um, the mine to your backyard, sadly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. you know, the, you know, frontline workers, right? So they were. They were still in and, and making products so that we could all, you know, live the life that we still uh, enjoy. But yeah, so we've we um, have done remote for two years. The offices opened mid March of this year, and uh, we we're leaving it up to employees to decide. It's a program called Work Your Way, and you decide with your supervisor whether you're going to be fully remote. Uh, 100% in the office or a hybrid. And so I chose a hybrid. I was just in the office, uh, was it yesterday or two days ago, um, to for a, for a big meeting that we had with our um, division operating committee. And it was great to see everybody. And so, yeah, I'll be, I go in, you know, try to target once, once a week around mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I learned today that GM ha- or 3M has a generous policy called 3M Gives. And it, the company allows you to do volunteer service, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can take some of your time uh, throughout the year to donate your, you know, volunteer efforts at community organizations. And then a lot of times they do a matching program too with uh, donations. So if you donate up to a certain amount, they'll match that donation to that organization as well. Have you taken advantage of that uh, opportunity to volunteer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, fitting in with the the enjoying DIY and construction. I've done some habitat uh, work and and I really like that. Just getting out and using a hammer again and getting to be around good people and, you know, enjoy it. That's awesome. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Josh. Is there anything you want to tell or ask our audience before we go? Um, no, I don't think so. Just try to stay informed, do your research, um, you know, look for those good products and listen to your show. I I like your advice and what you do here. So thank you. Thank you. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Josh Orman for joining us. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to FHB podcast at Taunton.com. And please like comment or review us. However you're listening, it helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Pay attention to your shingles, right, Josh? Absolutely.